wanted, let me start uh, with the question. What did you all do between uh, Christmas and New Year's Eve 2021? Yeah, probably, because most of the time this is a breathing period for yourself. So you have some time off, you have some slack time, or you basically just do what everybody does, eat stuff, uh, hang out, or uh, relax. Um, I had the privilege to work because I used up all my vacation days. Um, the good thing is that if you work during this period, you have a lot of time uh, because there's no ad hoc stuff happening and you can play around with stuff because the rest of the system usually stays stable. And um, what I did is um, I uh, worked on optimizing our um, infrastructure a bit. And when I talk about our infrastructure, let me first introduce the um, company I work for. I work for Ricardo, which is an online auctioning site in Switzerland, a second-hand marketplace, uh, and also for new articles. And it has been in the game for over 22 years, so quite a long time. Um, and that means, uh, since it's quite a long time in the game, it has seen a lot of changes and a lot of stuff happening during this uh, time. So um, starting with databases and different types of technologies, you can be sure that this, um, you know, this company has seen a lot. Uh, which brings me to the obvious question, then why Apache Beam? So why um, did we in the data intelligence team or I as a senior data en engineer in the data intelligence team at Ricardo choose Apache Beam? In 2018, when we started to modernize the data intelligence infrastructure, there were um, you know, a couple of frameworks and many frameworks to get the job done. So um, especially in the... Uh, in an open premise world, uh, there are things like Spark and so on. Um, but why Apache Beam then, and why not something else? Especially if you take a look at this. This is a, a real picture from the data center back then. This is the main core um, uh, data warehouse, an IBM, IBM system X. 360, 50, M3, something like that. So I looked it up, um, had a Xeon processor, um, yeah, a huge number of hard drives, but it actually was running full capacity. So um, there was not much um, you know, stuff left for us to put more data into it. Um, so we, we decided to migrate to the cloud and to BigQuery. Um, and we wanted something that uh, actually works on-premise, but also in the cloud later, so that we can actually leverage something that we, um, you know, not built for now and then have to redo it later. So we looked for a framework that actually can support both worlds, and Apache Beam does that. So that's one of the promises, that you can run it on-premise and you can run it in the cloud. So um, the next question then was ob obviously, okay, <laughs> There's a famous house track from John's, uh, Joe Smooth from 1989, uh, Promised Land. If you don't know it, you should actually definitely check it out. Um, it's a classic. Um, the question is, uh, can we make it to this Promised Land where we don't have to manage our own infrastructure anymore? Here is a caveat. Um, we didn't manage our own infrastructure back then because we had an operations team, we had an engineering team, and the data intelligence team was basically just going there and say, hey, can you do this for us or can you do that for us? And then they said, well, maybe next cycle or maybe in three weeks or maybe we don't have any time at all for this. So what we also wanted to do is what we wanted to manage our own stack and we want to be the owners of our own stack so that we can actually say we can deliver this or we, we can't deliver this. So... As has been already mentioned, I have been talking here before. So I will quickly go over um, the timeline, actually what happened between 2018 and 2021. So we introduced Beam, as I said, in 2018. That was the first steps we did with the framework. And we quickly had the first pipeline running on Flink on-premise in this data center um, by, the, yeah, by June or July 2018. And then you can see there's a huge gap. And now you might ask yourself, why there's a huge gap? Um, did I go on holidays? Was I in a gap year? Or did the whole team just say, you know, let's do something else? No. That was the period when the whole company decided to uh, move to the cloud. And all efforts were basically focusing on engineering, uh, getting all the live services towards the cloud. 
our decision to move to um, GCP had nothing to do with engineering moving to GCP. They decided on their own and they picked the cloud provider they found good or best for their use case. And uh, we had decided on GCP and we could have also lived with a situation where we were on GCP and they were on something else. So um, in 2020 then, so when we had all our um, uh, jobs running on Flink, basically these jobs were to source the data from um, yeah, Kafka into BigQuery. That was the main objective because before there were like batch loads. Um, you, you know, we had a data warehouse, you have batch loads um, coming from the operational database into the data warehouse. And then later um, Kafka was introduced and we used Kafka to de decouple this loading process. And then also after decoupling this load loading process, use this um, as an opportunity to jump to BigQuery. And um, after this use case that actually then expanded into many, many, many topics, many, many Kafka topics that had to be um, consumed, um, we decided to uh, give Python a try, which was then, uh, yeah, was stable at that time. And we had our first Python pipeline and that was running on Dataflow already. So that was something we didn't deploy. We tried it also on Flink, but then we thought, well, let's just try this also uh, with Dataflow and it worked great. It was a pipeline to, um, Detect linked accounts on Ricardo. If you want to find more about that, there's a bean talk about this at the previous conference. Um, we also then experimented with enrichment pipelines. So it has been uh, stressed here a lot. You can use, um, you know, different calling patterns to actually uh, take a stream and then call different uh, or external systems to enrich a, a pipeline. And we then um, also ordered this pipeline to um, work with Bigtable instead of. Um, Cassandra, and there's a blog post about it. So if you if you Google that, you will find all the details. I'm not going to bore you with this today. And we also then started using uh, the API calling pattern. So for example, when we want to detect a, a fraudulent case, we uh, run over our streams. And when there, as soon as we find a suspicious pattern, we're going to call um, for this particular set of data, um, an external API to say, hey, this could be a fraudulent case. Please customer care look into this, which happens on a, on a you know, auctioning platform because there can be cases where somebody's selling a fake uh, product or maybe some account has been hijacked or something similar. And then finally, um, in 2000, as I said, in this breathing period, I prepared the move. And in the beginning of 2022, we moved um, to Dataflow, but we moved everything. Also the 46 pipelines, that we had running on Flink to Dataflow. And now the question is, why move in the first place? So why now? Uh, was it because it was you know, this breathing period, I had nothing to do, and I thought, it's just fun, let's just do it? Maybe, but the main driver behind all of this was that um, our company, Ricardo, was basically now part of a conglomerate or a, the Swiss Marketplace Group, which has been founded in the end of 2021. And that meant that our team was growing. Uh, we had more people, so we actually doubled in size to 13 people. And we also needed to um, in to, uh, include or inject, ingest, ingest more data into our platform. So uh, before we were, had one platform, to, uh, in, you know, uh, which was Ricardo, which is for auctions. Now we also had Tutti for classifieds, and we also had Anibis for classifieds. And these data uh, were sometimes in different clouds, so sometimes on AWS, sometimes on-premise. Um, but we needed to get it into BigQuery to actually get one whole picture of everything. And we also get it uh, in a streaming sense. Um, so what we wanted to do was to stream, streamline the whole universe, right? So we had a chance here to say, OK, um, let's take a step back, make everything um, you know, one unified process and make sure it's easy to handle because it also makes it easier for people to onboard. Because when I was asking, you know, if, if, if I want to onboard you on something, I can get you excited about Beam, but if I then tell you, well, <laughs> you should also now learn how to operate a Flink cluster on K uh, Kubernetes, you might be like, yeah, maybe, I don't know, maybe, we, you know, then we just, you do it. We just write the code, you just execute it for us. And I'm like, ah, oh, no, actually, no, uh, maybe we should ask someone that can do it for us. So let's maybe then migrate to Dataflow so we don't have to deal with this. And uh, a quick question here, what do you think is the most in, in, uh, successful ingredient of a migration? You can just shout because we are in the room. Users. 
users users using the new thing yes patience yeah also good not shouting at people <laughs> Yeah. Continuity from the old. So proper executive support. I'm just repeating because, and then a continuity from the old thing to the new thing. That's all correct. I think if I condense what you just said, sorry, there was one more. So it parity, feature yeah. parity. So no missing feature, feature parity. Yes, exactly. And this is all um, correct. Uh, I think, and not debatable. And when I distill what you just said about users, executives, and uh, people dealing with it, what it boils down to is uh, people. <laughs> so here you see the uh, old team on the left. I said I need, don't need a pointer, now I need a pointer. So basically there's on the old team on the left and the new team on the right. So you see it has been growing. Um, you see the left team, um, you know, they're, they're looking at my code right now. I am looking at my code as well. And they're asking themselves, oh, how did you like, what the... Um, <laughs> but I think that, you know, it's software is about people. So it's uh, the most important thing is about, you know, get people excited, make them sure, make everything, make them feel safe, not only in a, in a, in a um, social sense, but also in the sense of handling the new stuff. And uh, people want to know the time and not how the clock works. So if you if I go to people, and this is something I learned the hard way, so if I go to people and tell them, yeah, it's so awesome because with Flink you can tweak this and this, and then you know you can optimize the cost, and then you just tweak this little parameter in the Amplify, they're like, I don't care, like just you know just run it. Nobody cares about it. Like okay, so the main objective here for us was reducing the the cognitive load. That was the major uh, priority for me. Um, so. That meant, okay, switching to data flow should actually remove the need for explaining the clock working explanation, at least uh, for this part. So let's migrate. And since we are using Beam and we use the Java SDK, as I said, for the these pipelines for the 46 uh, Kafka to BigQuery pipelines, uh, it's easy, right? You just switch the Maven profile uh, from the Flink runner to the data flow runner and you're done. And that's it. Thank you very much. See you. No, that's not actually how it worked. <laughs> um, so we had, we, I, we're not too many pitfalls, but I'm just going to over them. So this is like the part where you can, uh, the, you, you get the slides anyway, but um, the thing is that uh, those things were kind of universal um, also, I think, to other services. So the pitfall number one was um, we were using Flink inside a Kubernetes cluster, and we are a customer of Confluent Cloud. And Confluent Cloud is a private, Kafka cluster for us. So that means that we can only access it through VPC peering. That means that uh, when you launch a Dataflow pipeline, uh, I don't know if you're aware, but if you use a Dataflow or if you use a Beam pipeline with the Kafka IO, it needs, when it launches the pipeline, to connect to Kafka to know the number of partitions. Otherwise, you need to manually inject the number of partitions. The word manually actually always uh, throws me off. So I'm like, okay, it's, <laughs> this is not good. I want this to work. So um, to launch this pipeline, somehow I need to be able to connect to Kafka. The question is how? So recap, um, to launch a uh, Kafka pipeline with Apache Beam, you need to be able to connect to Kafka from the system that actually launches the pipeline. Later, the data flow workers need to be able to connect, which is fine because they're on the same VPC. But in our situation, Launching it from my local machine or launching it from our CI system doesn't work because it's not in the same VPC. Um, how can we get around this? Well, um, I'm a terminal fan, so I just said, okay, let's just do a bash container, um, put all the uh, things inside, and then just launch the pipeline from within this uh, bash container. And in the beginning, everybody was like, yeah, it's cool. It's a temporary solution until it's actually, you know, if we find something better. But since today, it's the, it's the same solution because it just works. So um, it actually has been copied by another team that is starting using uh, Dataflow. So for me, that's uh, proof enough that it actually is, is easy enough to operate because all you need to do is you go to the launcher pod, you execute the start command. We have a startup script and, you know, that works. And I also could use some bash magic there. So I'm fine. Uh, pit file number two, um, when I was migrating uh, and everything worked, I was like, yeah, nice, I'm done. Like, uh, I actually had a coffee, and then I was like, I'm just going to, you know, go into my Kafka test data set, and I'm checking the tables, and everything looked nice until I actually went to a table, because then we, we usually have US ASCII um, 
keys and everything. So in the columns, it was fine. But at some point, then I went to a table where we had user entered descriptions. And since we are in Switzerland, we have four official languages, and we have French, and we have German, and they have weird, you know, um, characters. And uh, I found out that they were just basically scrambled. And I was like, how can this be? Because the code didn't change. Uh, and what I found is that um, the you know the Google Cloud Data Flow service has used ASCII as a default encoding. And if you not explicitly say, uh, I want UTF-8, it will just use the default encoding. And um, yeah, that's, uh, you know, it, it took me some time to figure it out because I was like, it, it's definitely in my code. It's some dependency. I don't know. It's And then uh, actually it boiled down to this. So we're using protobuf for serialization and deserialization. We serialize always to JSON because it's human readable. We don't have so much data volume in most topics uh, that it actually justifies to um, to serialize to um, bytecode or like data flow serialized, sorry, protobuf serialized format. Um, but uh, you know the JSON format here is from the protobuf package, and we use here the um, we enforce the standard char set UTF-8 here, and then basically boom, it goes away. Um, and you know if you're asking why, I mean again, we use JSON for better better debuggability, and we have some topics where the traffic is so high that it justifies to remove that, but in most cases, uh, you know, for other engineering teams, it's easier for them also when they can just use Kafka Cat to inspect topics. So unless we have a performance reason uh, to switch to um, the serialization format of protobuf binary, that's the right name, uh, we tend to use JSON because it's just easier. Um, because human error always is um, harder and more costly than machine performance for us. So um, coming to operations, uh, as you know, um, with uh, how to say, with Kafka, uh, we we tend to love the fact that we can, or actually with any message bus, you tend to love the fact that you can just rewind the stuff and then you can um, start again and reading things, right? And when um, I think I think every week or every second week, or every week actually, we de we deploy topics because we have updated. Or one of the forty six topics has an updated field. Uh, and, and, and we always only allow field uh, addition. We never allow field deletion. We allow free duplication because of backward compatibility. But uh, when we want to deploy these changes, um, usually what we did before, we had the Flink interface. We had uh, one topic per uh, pipeline. So we went to the interface, the web interface, or the command line interface. We canceled the specific topic, let's say transactions. And then we updated the code, and then we restarted transaction and only transactions because that's the only topic that changed. But um, in Dataflow, uh, what we did is um, we use uh, uh, one pipeline for all the 26 topics. That has the following reason: because auto scaling works better, and also because we have topics out of these 46 topics that are very have very low traffic. It doesn't justify running uh, one job per topic because you have, I don't know. So the messages don't never ever uh, saturate uh, to vCPUs. So what we did is basically we said, okay, we want to run all 46 um, topics on, um, on, one, on one job. And that actually changes the operation. So the question now is, okay, when we want to update one topic, the transaction topic, how do we then, you know, when we cancel all pipelines, how do we then reset the offset? Because before we could always um, just have a parameter to launch a pipeline to say, reset to minus three days, but we don't want to do this for all topics all the time, right? So that's not really um, what we wanted, especially because, and this is a nitpick, I make it very quick, um, it will basically sometimes fail because some topics don't have so much timestamp in the past. So some topics have so l l less traffic that you cannot rewind three days ago, so it will basically be a problem for you. Um, so here is the solution to that. So we use the Kafka consumer groups um, uh, command that actually, uh, so we cancel the job in data flow. And instead of um, using the Kafka IO API to read past days of data per topic, we basically go and use um, the uh, Kafka consumer groups command, which comes with Kafka to reset uh, all topics for the uh, group beam consumers to go back in time. And that actually allows us to do this uh, on the Kafka side of things. So recap, uh, we've switched in the last four years from on-premise to cloud, from batch to streaming, from Flink to Dataflow, 
and we lowered uh, our operational overhead and freed up resources while keeping the costs under control. So we had basically, when we just did this switch from um, Flink to Dataflow and we didn't have additional use cases, we were kind of cost neutral. So uh, it was really not um, maybe plus 5% or something, but it was really in the same ballpark. And that made us really, really happy. Um, and now, of course, we have more and more use cases. So now, since we have data flow in place, we can say, hey, uh, uh, look at this. It's a nice framework. You can use it. And you don't need to do the operations. And uh, the search team at our company has already um, started using uh, now Beam for using uh, it to update the search indexes for solar. Uh, and also for um, more advanced machine learning use cases, we now can leverage Beam because people don't have to think about, uh, you know, how does the clock work, but just asking for the time. So since I asked for the time, I think my time is up now. And I want to say a huge thank you uh, for attending this talk and also to the organizers and uh, to everybody who made this such a nice event. Oh, 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 oh,